Hey there it goes. All right, we're live. Welcome to today's program. Uh, there is nobody here and nobody likes it. <laughs> hey, that's all right. No problem. Still going to do a program today, even if nobody's watching it. Uh, it's 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here in the beautiful uh, overcast mountains of Northeast Tennessee in Kings, uh, lovely Kingsport, Tennessee. And uh, today, I want to share something. Someone at church, I have a I have a birthday here coming up, and uh, they bought me a special present. And uh, this is this is a one of the best gifts like literally anyone's ever given me. Like this is so cool. Somebody got me an original 1923 edition, the year it was published, of Jake Grim Machen's Christianity and Liberalism. Okay. So here is my original, my original edition, Christianity and Liberalism by Machen, published by Macmillan Publishers. And you can see this right here. Uh, let me see. It. Yeah, let's check this out. 1923, Macmillan Publishers. That is the year this was published. So this, this is an original edition of this. And it says, by J. Gresson Machen, Assistant Professor. Professor of New Testament Literature and Exegesis at Princeton Theological Seminary. So isn't that cool? And so this is kind of a, a shot in the arm to get back to that series where I was reading through uh, this book because um, what's being identified today as, well, as progressivism um, is really just uh, a warmed over version of the very things that uh, Machen himself dealt with in Christianity and liberalism. And the progressive stuff that's going on today of course, is nothing new. It's just a rehashing of, of old apostasy and old error. Uh, but I, I wanted to uh, pick up this, and I, I know I'm not picking up like exactly where I left off, but I did remember the chapter on salvation. Just to, to go over real quick, the titles of Machen's book, Christianity and Liberalism. He he titled the titled the chapters Introduction, Doctrine, just the, the whole concept of doctrine, the importance of doctrine, God and Man, the Bible, Christ salvation the church in other words what mason recognized was that the liberalism of his day the progressivism of his day it was an attack on the on the entire christian faith and so the reason christianity and liberalism this little book is so excellent is it's kind of a, a miniature systematic theology really he, he goes over all of the major loci of christian doctrine he goes over all of it in the book from the inspiration of scripture the importance of God, you know, who is God, the transcendence of God, the holiness of God, what is man, this, the fall, the sin of man, and, and so on and so forth. And then he goes through everything else, salvation, uh, grace, what, what is grace, and what does it mean to be saved by grace? Because one thing Machen points out, um, not just in, in this book, but I believe it's also in uh, What is Faith by Machen, is that liberalism is not only just rank unbelief, and so is progressivism, it's just rank unbelief. It's a form of legalism, because if you don't have the supernatural redemptive religion of God as taught in Scripture, well, what are you what are you left with? Well, you're you're left with the with the rules of men. <laughs> you're left with the rules of of men. Okay, um, yeah, I, I'm looking at the, at the channel over here. People are chatting. Um, I I was actually I was actually thinking about that today. Getting back to the Westminster Confession, I do want to get through. I do want to go back and go through. The Westminster Confession, because that's my own confession, and I love it so much, and I have taught through it many times, and um, we need to do that. We need to uh, to get those out there. But I noticed, strangely enough, when I was doing those, those videos didn't get very many views at all, and I was really I was really disappointed by that. I thought more people would be interested in not just what the Westminster Confession says, but also what the the key passages of Scripture and all that stuff. But that just um, people weren't weren't really this didn't seem overly interested. So maybe Mason, you can, maybe you can uh, promote it or something for him, <laughs> share it on social media or something like that. But anyway, I wanted to read uh, as much of the chapter on salvation. This is a great chapter. In fact, this um, edition, okay, good, good. It looked like the pages are falling out. This is in real good, real good condition of salvation. Okay. Chapter six of Machen's classic work here. It has been observed thus far that liberalism differs from Christianity with regard to the presuppositions of the gospel, the view of God and the view of man, with regard to the book, the book is capitalized, meaning the Bible, 
in which the gospel is contained and with regard to the person whose work the gospel sets forth. It is not surprising that it differs from Christianity in its account of the gospel itself. It is not surprising that it presents an entirely different account of the way of salvation. Liberalism finds salvation, so far as it's willing to speak at all of salvation, in man. Christianity finds it in an act of God. It couldn't be clearer than that, could it? What, what is liberalism? Where does liberalism find salvation? In man. Where does the scripture present, where does Christianity present salvation? In God, an act of God. The difference with regard to the way of salvation concerns, in the first place, the basis of salvation in the redeeming work of Christ. According to Christian belief, Jesus is our Savior, not by virtue of what he said, not by virtue of what he was, but by what he did. He is our Savior, not because he has inspired us to live the same kind of life that he lived, but because he took upon himself the dreadful guilt of our sins and bore it instead of us on the cross. Such is the Christian conception of the cross of Christ. It is ridiculed as being a subtle theory of the atonement. In reality, it is the plain teaching of the word of God. We know absolutely nothing about an atonement that is not a vicarious atonement, for that is the only atonement of which the New Testament speaks. <laughs> Just breaking from the quotation here. I remember when I was in seminary and even before that a little bit, you learn about the uh, different theories of the atonement. And you, I remember thinking, how many how many theories of the atonement can there be? And then you learn about the, the governmental theory where uh, Jesus' death on the cross shows the world that sin is serious and that God takes it seriously and you guys better get your act together. How would Jesus dying on the cross do that? And then you get the idea that, well, it's just a, a moral influence, the moral influence theory of the atonement. That how, how much does God love us? He loved us so much he sent Jesus to die for us. I loved B.B. Warfield's uh, response to that, the moral influence theory of the atonement. It just instills a moral influence to the world. Warfield said, that's as, as odd as a parent saying, here, let me show you how much I love killing one of my kids for you. Well, the only reason you can say that the atonement is a loving act is precisely because it does take away the penalty of sin. If it didn't do that, in what possible way could we say it was a loving act? And that's what uh, Warfield pointed out. Okay, so, so um, the, the theory of the substitutionary atonement, that's just, uh, that's just one, one among many theories of the atonement. And that Mason says, in reality, it is the plain teaching of the word of God. We know absolutely nothing about an atonement that's not a vicarious atonement, not a substitutionary atonement. For that is the only atonement of which the New Testament speaks. Think of Galatians 3.13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse, huper hemon, in behalf of us, vicariously, substitutionarily. It goes on, and this Bible doctrine is not intricate or subtle. On the contrary, though it involves mysteries, it is itself so simple that a child can understand it. We deserve eternal death, but the Lord Jesus, because he loved us, died instead of us on the cross. Surely there is nothing so very intricate about that. It gets breaking from the quotation, but you need a PhD in theology to make that complicated. Just picking up again. It is not the Bible doctrine of the atonement which is difficult to understand. What are really comprehensible are the elaborate modern efforts to get rid of the Bible doctrine in the interests of human pride. Yeah, I love Machen. Yeah, clarity and courage. Clarity and courage. He says, now listen closely here to this section. Modern liberal preachers do indeed sometimes speak of the atonement but they speak of it just as seldom as they possibly can. And one can see plainly that their hearts are elsewhere than at the foot of the cross. Indeed, at this point, as at many others, one has the feeling that traditional language is being strained to become the expression of totally alien ideas. And when the traditional phraseology has been stripped away, the essence of the modern conception of the death of Christ, though that conception appears in many forms, is fairly plain. The essence of it is that the death of Christ had an effect not upon God, but only on man. 
sometimes the effect upon man is conceived of in a very simple way. Christ's death being regarded merely as an example of self-sacrifice for us to imitate. Ugh, doesn't that just make you sick? I mean, this is this is the Jesus as cheerleader theology. What does he do? He's just, he's such a great example to follow. In fact, I've been doing a little reading in preparation for the sermon series I'm doing right now on the history of the August Pelagian controversy and looking at what Pelagius said. And Pelagius looked at Jesus as a better example than the first Adam. The first Adam set a bad example. The second Adam sets a better example. So don't follow the first Adam's example. Follow the follow Christ's example. And that is as far from divine truth and revelation as far as how we're saved as you could be. You could not more badly misunderstand Jesus than to think of him merely as a moral example to follow. Listen, some, I just want to read that sentence again. Sometimes by the modern liberal preachers, and I would say today by the progressive preachers, the effect upon man is conceived of in a very simple way. Christ's death being regarded merely as an example of self-sacrifice for us to, em for, to emulate or imitate. The uniqueness of this particular example, then, can be found only in the fact that Christian sentiment gathered around it has made it a convenient symbol for all self-sacrifice. It puts in concrete form, otherwise have to be expressed in colder general terms. Sometimes, again, the effect of Christ's death upon us is conceived of in subtler ways. The death of Christ, it is said, shows how much God hates sin, since sin brought even the Holy One to the dreadful cross. And we too, therefore, ought to hate sin, as God hates it, and repent. Sometimes, still again, the death of Christ is thought of as displaying the love of God. It exhibits God's own Son as given up for us all. Modern theories of the atonement are not all to be placed upon the same plane. The last of them, in particular, may be joined with a high view of Jesus' person, but they err in that they ignore the dreadful reality of guilt and make a mere persuasion of the human will all that is needed for salvation. You see, you see what he's saying? The liberals preached, yes, Jesus died. What a great example of self-sacrifice that is. And you should imitate him. And that should motivate you to hate sin and motivate you to want to be better in life and things like that. Whereas the scriptural conception is that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty to deal with the judicial curse and wrath of God against us for our sins. That's why he died. That's why he was nailed to the cross. Because he loved his people so much, he didn't want them to receive the justice of God for their sins. If you don't see that, that Jesus' death is dealing with our guilt and with the righteous wrath of God against us for our sins, you don't understand Christianity at all. You don't understand it at all. Yeah, Machen continues, they do indeed all contain an element of truth. It is true that the death of Christ is an example of self-sacrifice, which may inspire self-sacrifice in others. It is true that the death of Christ shows how much God did. It is true that the death of Christ displays the love of God. All these truths are found plainly in the New Testament. Listen, but they are swallowed up in a far greater truth, that Christ died instead of us to present us faultless before the throne of God. Without that central truth, all the rest is, is devoid of real meaning. An example of self-sacrifice is useless to those who are under the guilt and thraldom of sin. The knowledge of God's hatred of sin can in itself bring only despair. An, an exhibition of the love of God is, is a mere display unless there was some underlying reason for the sacrifice. If the cross is to be restored to its rightful place in the Christian life, we shall have to penetrate far beneath the modern theories to him who loved us and gave him for us. Well, what does that mean? That is such a simple biblical expression. Jesus died for my sins. And what does that mean? It means that God the Father held Jesus, his son, legally responsible for having committed every sin I will ever commit, have ever committed, and am presently committing. 
he is legally charged and condemned and pays the penalty for all of that. And it's only because his death does that that it is an, a something worthy of imitation. It's only because it pays for the guilt and removes the wrath of God. It's only because 1 Peter 2.24 says, Christ bore in his body our sins upon the cross. It's only because it does that that we can say it's a love act. You see, to try to say this is a, an act of self-sacrifice we should imitate, it's an act of the love of God, it shows God hates sin. Well, that's all true. But it doesn't have any real meaning, real application to us, unless our sins are actually dealt with at that cross. Upon the Christian doctrine of the cross, modern liberals are never weary of pouring out the vials of their hatred and their scorn. Just breaking from the quotation. I did a couple of podcasts years ago. Um, a, a convert to Eastern Orthodoxy had sent me a, a link to a sermon by a, a priest named Thomas Hopko. And it was on the cross. It was a 56 minute long sermon on the cross of Christ. It was the worst sermon I have ever heard. I have never listened to someone for nearly an hour spew more of their venom on the cross, substitutionary cross work of Christ than Father Thomas Hopko did in, the, in that 56 minutes. And I did two podcasts where I reviewed that message. It was appalling. And I, I just was reminded of that. Upon the Christian doctrine of the cross, modern liberals are never weary of pouring out the vials of their hatred and their scorn. It's very sad and it's frightening when you listen to a liberal or a progressive or you know someone in a false religion like Eastern Orthodoxy pouring out their hatred on the constitutionary cross work, pouring out their utter hatred upon the only thing that can save them from the wrath of God. What a strange thing to vent hatred upon the only means by which you can be made right with God and be happy for eternity. We, we are so irrational in our sin. Says Machen, even at this point, it is true, the hope of avoiding offense is not always abandoned. The words vicarious atonement and the like, of course, in a sense totally at variance from their Christian meaning, are still sometimes used. You see what he's pointing out? The progressives and the liberals, they sound like they're Christians. You know, um, Friedrich Schleiermacher, the father father of modern liberalism, um, he sounds like an evangelical. If you read his sermons, he actually he sounds like a like a Christian. But you know, he's redefining every every term he's using. Okay, let me see what's going on over here in the channel. We are told to be imitators of God and imitators of Paul. Both commands show me how desperately I need Christ's perfect life. Amen. That's right. <laughs> be imitators of God as dear children. It says there in Ephesians five, and then. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 16, yeah, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. But yes, uh, yeah, we are to imitate God. We are to imitate his graciousness and his kindness, but we'll never imitate him perfectly, and that's why we need the righteousness of Christ to justify us and get us into heaven. There's strict Baptist. Hey, strict Baptist, good to see you, ma'am. Um, and then, oh, there's one of my kiddos. Hi, your dad. Is that Lily? Those other theories are not only absolutely absurd, but extremely offensive toward Christ and all he suffered and did. Amen. Amen. Is that Lily? Lily, did you write that? That's exactly correct, sweetheart. Right on the money. Okay. But despite such occasional employment of traditional language, liberal preachers reveal only too clearly what is in their minds. They speak with disgust of those who believe, quote, that the blood of our Lord shed in a substitutionary debt death placates an alienated deity and makes possible welcome for the returning sinner, end quote. Against the doctrine of the cross, they use every weapon of caricature and vilification. Thus, they pour out their scorn upon a thing so holy and so precious that in the presence of it, the Christian heart melts in gratitude too deep for words. <laughs> that's a great sentence. See, that's, that's how I, that's how I, try to write and preach is, is like that listen to that again against the doctrine of the cross they use every weapon of caricature and vilification let me give you some examples nt right oh, the, the the cross is divine child abuse you know they'll, they'll say it, it's divine child abuse the, that's caricature and vilification thus they pour out their scorn upon a thing so holy and so precious 
that in the presence of it, the Christian heart melts in gratitude too deep for words. Yeah, when I hear people mocking the cross work of Christ and the substitutionary atoning work of Christ, it makes me so thankful, so thankful that I believe in it. I'm listening to Thomas Hopko. There were a couple of times, you know, I was thinking about that after I did those podcasts uh, way back. I actually got down on my knees in my bedroom before I went to bed and praised God. Thank you for saving me from that kind of foolishness because it's only the grace of God. It is only by his grace that we're diff- that we differ from anybody on things like that. Says Machen, it never seems to occur to modern liberals that in the deriding that in deriding the Christian doctrine of the cross, they are trampling upon human hearts. But the modern liberal attacks upon the Christian doctrine of the cross may at least serve the purpose of showing what that doctrine is. And from the point of view, they may be examined now. From this point of view, they may be briefly examined now. In the first place, then, the Christian way of salvation through the cross of Christ is criticized because it is dependent upon history. (laughs) The the liberals don't like that. They want things to just be in, in the realm of theory and ideas. But that's the beauty of the Christian faith. It's rooted in historical events and real facts about those events. That's what I love. That's why I have so much friends. It's because it's what Christ did 2,000 years ago. I wasn't there. I wasn't there to mess it up. All I do is receive it as a free gift. Praise the Lord for that. It's his accomplishment. It's the perfection of what he did. That's why we're right with God. That's why those that repent, those that see their sin and have the, the, the Holy Spirit wrought work of conviction in their hearts and they hate their sin and they're relying on Christ alone for eternal salvation, they have eternal life and they can be sure they have eternal life. This criticism is sometimes evaded. It is sometimes said that as Christians, we may attend to what Christ does now for every Christian rather than to what he did long ago in Palestine. But the evasion involves a total abandonment of the Christian faith. Exactly right. The whole Christian faith is what Jesus did a long time ago in Palestine. Why, why am I going to go to heaven? Because a man, the God-man, died on a Roman cross out the city of Jerusalem a couple thousand years ago. That reconciled me to God. And that's why I have peace with God. So yes, I'm very thankful for the things the Lord is doing in my life today and the ways he's at work in my life and the ways he's at work in our church and in the lives of others. But my salvation was accomplished a couple thousand years ago outside of Jerusalem one afternoon for a few hours where Jesus was nailed to a cross and died there. And that he was taken off the cross, dead, just like any other human being that's ever died. Wrapped up, laid in a tomb, and he conquered death. He rose from the dead. That is why I'm going to heaven. I just rest on that. I assure you, I will die resting only on that. I'm thankful for the work the Lord has done on my life, for the sin he's helped me overcome, and for the ways he's convicted me and changed me and chipped away at me and and broken me. Very, very thankful for all of that. But as I'm dying, all I'm going to be thinking about is him carrying that cross up that road and willingly laying his life down there. He died. But what did God tell Adam? In the day you eat of it, you will surely die. So to be right with God, what's got to happen? A perfect person has got to die in our place. And not only die in our place, but conquer death in our place and come back to life, which he did. If the saving work of Christ were confined to what he does now for every Christian, there would be no such thing as a Christian gospel, an account of an event which put a new face on life. What we should have left would be simply mysticism, and mysticism is quite different from Christianity. It is the connection of the present experience of the believer with an actual historical appearance of Jesus in the world, which prevents our religion from being mysticism and causes it to be Christianity man you know um i pray i still pray occasionally give us another machin lord (laughs) we need give us a hundred machins give us a bunch of rc scrolls give us some people that that can write and talk and think like this it says machin it must be certain it must certainly be admitted then that christianity does depend upon something that happened 
our religion must be abandoned altogether unless at a definite point in history, Jesus died as a propitiation for the sins of men. Christianity is certainly dependent upon history. But if so, the objection lies very near. Must we really depend for the welfare of our souls upon what happened long ago? Must we really rate, wait? Must we really wait until historians have finished disputing about the value of sources and the like before we can have peace with God? Would it not be better to have salvation, which is with us here and now, and which depends only upon what we can see or feel? With regard to this objection, it should be observed that if religion be made independent of history, there is no such thing as a gospel. For gospel means good news, tidings, information about something that has happened. A gospel independent of history is a contradiction in terms. The Christian gospel means not a presentation of what always has been true, but a report of some something new, something that imparts a totally different aspect to the situation of mankind. The situation of mankind was desperate because of sin, but God has changed the situation by the atoning death of Christ. That is no mere reflection upon the old, but an account of something new. We are shut up in this world as in a beleaguered camp. To maintain our courage, the liberal preacher offers us exhortation. Make the best of the situation, he says. Look on the bright side of life. But unfortunately, such exhortation cannot change the facts. In particular, it cannot remove the dreadful fact of sin. Very different is the message of the Christian evangelist. He offers not reflection on the old, but tidings of something new. Not exhortation, but a gospel. It is true that the Christian gospel is an account, not of something that happened yesterday, but of something that happened long ago. But the important thing is that it really happened. If it really happened, then it makes little difference when it happened. No matter when it happened, whether yesterday or in the first century, it remains a real gospel, a real piece of news. The happening of long ago, moreover, is in this case confirmed by present experience. The Christian man receives first the account which the New Testament gives of the atoning death of Christ. That account is history. But if true, it has effects in the present, and it can be tested by its effects. The Christian man makes trial of the Christian message and makes trial and making trial of it, he finds it to be true. Experience does not provide a substitute for the documentary evidence, but it does confirm that evidence. The word of the cross no longer seems to the Christian to be merely a far off thing, a matter to be disputed about by trained theologians. On the contrary, it is received into the Christian's inmost soul and every day and hour of the Christian's life brings new confirmation of its truth. Man, that's great. In the second place, the Christian doctrine of salvation through the death of Christ is criticized by the liberals, by the progressives, that it is narrow. It binds salvation to the name of Jesus. And there are many men in the world who have never in any effective way heard the name of Jesus. What is really needed, we are told, is a salvation which will save all men everywhere whether they have heard of Jesus or not, and whatever may be the type of life to which they have been reared. Not a new creed, it is said, will meet the universal need of the world, but some means of making effective and right living whatever creed men may chance to have. This second objection, as well as the first, and this idea that, well, it's too narrow. Christianity is just too narrow. This second objection, as well as the first, is sometimes, is sometimes evaded. It is sometimes said that, Although one way of salvation is by means of acceptance of the gospel, there may be other ways. But this method of meeting the objection relinquishes one of the things that are most obviously characteristic of the Christian message, namely its exclusiveness. What struck the early observers of Christianity most forcibly was not merely that salvation was offered by means of the Christian gospel, but that all other means were resolutely rejected. Okay, stop right there. This is the part that for uh, Christians living in relativistic, irrational America today, we've got to be ready to be criticized for this. 
we we are not just saying, well, Jesus, Jesus is a way of salvation. We're saying all other pretensions at salvation are to be resolutely rejected as false. And the thing is, historically, that is what got Christians in so much trouble. That's what got them in trouble with Rome. It wasn't that they had a new God. It was, they said theirs was the only one. It wasn't that they proposed a way of, of salvation. It was, they said, our way is true and all of yours aren't true. And as a matter of fact, you're all going to hell forever when you die. And as much as Stephen Furtick and all the rest of them would love to make that cool and love to make it popular, you just can't. And that's as repulsive to people today as it has been throughout all of history. Okay, listen. I think I might, I might have just lost all oh, here. What struck the early observers of Christianity most forcibly was not merely that salvation was offered by means of the Christian gospel, but that all other means were resolutely rejected. The early Christian missionaries demanded an absolutely exclusive devotion to Christ. In fact, I'll just break it from the quotation. It was to repudiate all of your former confidence in whatever, what, whatever religion, whatever false religion you were involved in, whatever one you used to trust in. That's why Paul says he didn't add Jesus to his Pharisaic righteousness. He recognized that everything he had been trusting in before in Philippians chapter 3 was a pile of excrement. Scubalon. Indeed, I regard all things as rubbish in comparison to the surpassing knowledge of Christ, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God and is by faith. Says Machen, such exclusiveness ran directly counter to the prevailing syncretism of the Hellenistic age. Now, syncretism simply means we, we just blur the lines and, and combine all religious ideas together. Christianity has always been radically opposed to that. It's this alone is the revealed truth of one true God. And anything contrary to it is damnable and false. So the exclusive claims of the gospel, Acts 4.12, Peter stood up, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven among men, by which we must be saved in Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That went right up against the syncretism of the hell and the gauge. The let's just syncretize everything. Everything, we just mix it all together into this pantheon of deities. And over against that, here comes the apostles. Here comes the Lord Jesus. Your religions aren't true. What you believe will leave you damned in hell forever. Repent and believe the one truth, the one exclusive truth. It says Machen, in that day, many saviors were offered by many religions to the attention of men, but the various pagan religions could live together in perfect harmony. When a man became a devotee of one God, he did not have to give up all the others. But Christianity would have nothing to do with these courtly polygamies of the soul. It demanded an absolutely exclusive devotion. All other saviors, it insisted, must be deserted for the one Lord. Salvation, in other words, was not merely through Christ, but it was only through Christ. And that little word, only, lay all the offense. <laughs> That's what offended everybody. We're not saying, hey, listen, can we bring our God alongside yours and all have a party together? It was, you need to repent and turn your back on your false deities and embrace the one true one, the one true Savior. Without that word, there would have been no persecutions. The word only, Jesus is the only Savior. Without that word, there would have been no persecutions. The cultured men of the day would probably have been willing to give Jesus a place and an honorable place among the saviors of mankind. Without its exclusiveness, the Christian message would have seemed perfectly inoffensive to the men of that day. So modern liberalism, placing Jesus alongside other benefactors of mankind, 
is perfectly inoffensive in the modern world. You hear that? What an indictment against progressivism and liberalism. The, the justice that is preached by progressives, I don't care if they're in the OPC or the PCA or whatever, or the liberal churches, those Jesuses don't offend anyone. And I've said it from the pulpit before, the Jesus of the progressives, the Jesus of liberals is not the real Jesus. He has the same name, but it's not the real Jesus. And the Jesus of liberals would never have been crucified because the Jesus of liberals would have believed in nothing and stood for nothing, just like those who preach him. So modern liberalism, placing Jesus alongside other benefactors of mankind is perfectly inoffensive in the modern world. A Jesus that doesn't offend anybody is not the true Jesus. All men speak well of it. It is entirely inoffensive. But it is also entirely futile. The offense of the cross is done away, but so is the glory and the power. Thus, it must fairly be admitted that Christianity does bind salvation to the name of Christ. The question need not here be discussed whether the benefits of Christ's death are ever applied to those who, though they have come to years of discretion, have not heard or accepted the gospel message. Certainly the New Testament holds out with regard to this matter no clear hope. At the very basis of the work of the apostolic church and the consciousness of a terrible responsibility it is the consciousness of a terrible responsibility. The sole message of life and salvation have been committed to men. That message was at all hazards to be proclaimed while yet there was time. The objection as to the exclusiveness of the Christian way of salvation, therefore, cannot be evaded, but must be met. Okay, so we got to answer this challenge. When people get all upset at us for being exclusive, we got to answer this challenge. Here it is. And it answer this objection that we're too exclusive. It may be sim said simply that the Christian way of salvation is narrow, only so long as the church chooses to let it remain narrow. The name of Jesus is discovered to be strangely adapted to men of every race and of every kind of pre previous education. And the church has ample means with promise of God's spirit to bring the name of Jesus to all. If therefore this way of salvation is not offered to all, it is not the fault of the way of salvation itself, but the fault of those who fail to use the means that God has placed in their hands. It's pretty remarkable. You hear professing Christians want to sit around and speculate all day long about whether someone can make a generic faith move toward God who's never heard the gospel, blah, 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 blah. But those people won't lift a finger to go out and tell anyone about Christ. Those people won't lift a finger to go out and give out tracts or try to talk to people about what it means to be forgiven in the sight of God, what it means to repent and come to Jesus. Let's see who else is over here now. I'm grateful for the videos. Thank you a few times. Wonderful. Good. I'm glad you. I'm glad you watched that one. That, that's very good. Um, men in the pulpit with a passion for the gospel, accurate communication of the gospel, and a desire to see the gospel, to rob Satan of the image bearers over whom he holds sway for God's glory. Amen. Not their own are tragically very rare, <clears throat> at least in the U.S. Yeah, that's true. They are pretty pretty rare, sadly. Says Machen. But it may be said, is that not a stupendous responsibility to place in the hands of weak and sinful men? Is it not more natural that God should offer salvation to all without requiring them to accept a new message and thus to be dependent upon the faithfulness of the messengers? The answer to this objection is plain. It is certainly true that the Christian way of salvation places a stupendous responsibility upon men, but that responsibility is like the responsibility which, as ordinary observation, observation shows, God does, as a matter of fact, commit to men. It is like the responsibility, for example, of the parent for the child. The parent has full power to mar the soul as well as the body of the child. The responsibility is terrible, but it is a responsibility which unquestionably exists. Similar is the responsibility of the church for making the name of Jesus known to all mankind. It is a terrible responsibility, but it exists, and it is just like the other, the other known dealings of God. But modern liberalism still has more specific objections to the Christian doctrine of the cross, how can one person, it is asked, suffer for the sins of another? The thing, we are told, is absurd. Guilt, it is said, is personal. If I allow another man to suffer for my fault, my guilt is not thereby one whit diminished. 
An answer to this objection is sometimes found in the plain instances in ordinary human life, where one person does suffer for another person's sake. In the war, for example, many men died freely for the welfare of others. Here it is said we have something analogous to the sacrifice of Christ. Of course, what he means by the war is World War I, not World War II. It must be confessed, however, that the analogy is very faint, for it does not touch the specific point at issue. The death of a volunteer soldier in the war was like the death of Christ in that it was a supreme example of self-sacrifice. But the thing to be accomplished by the self-sacrifice was entirely different from the thing which was accomplished by on Calvary. The death of those who sacrificed themselves in the war brought peace and protection to the loved ones at home, but it could never avail to wipe out the guilt of sin. The real answer to the objection is to be found not in the similarity between the death of Christ and other examples of self-sacrifice, but in the profound difference. Now listen carefully to this. Why is it that men are no longer willing to trust for their own salvation and for the hope of the world to one act that was done by one man of long ago? Why is it that they put to tr they prefer to trust to trust to million acts of self-sacrifice wrought by millions of men all through the centuries and in our own day? The answer is plain. It is because men have lost sight of the majesty of Jesus's person. They think of him as a man like themselves. And if he was a man like themselves, his death becomes simply an example of self-sacrifice. But there have been millions of examples of self-sacrifice. Why then should we pay such exclusive attention to this one Palestinian example of long ago? Men used to say with reference to Jesus, there was no other good, there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. They say now no longer, on the contrary, every man is now regarded as plenty good enough to pay the price of sin if, whether in peace or in war, he will only go bravely over the top in some noble cause. It is perfectly true that no mere man can pay the penalty of another man's sins, but it does not follow that Jesus could not do it, for Jesus was no mere man, but the eternal Son of God. Jesus is master of the inmost secrets of the moral world. He has done what no other could possibly do, he has borne our sin. The Christian doctrine of the atonement, therefore, is altogether rooted in the Christian doctrine of the deity of Christ. The reality of an atonement for sin depends altogether upon the New Testament presentation of the person of Christ. And even the hymns dealing with the cross, which we sing in church, can be placed in an ascending veil according as they are based upon a lower or higher view of Jesus' person. At the very bottom of the scale is that familiar hymn, Nearer my God to thee, nearer to thee, e'en though it be a cross that raiseth me. That is a perfectly good hymn. It means that our trials may be a discipline to bring us nearer to God. The thought is not opposed to Christianity. It is found in the New Testament. But many persons have the impression, because the word cross is found in the hymn, that, that there is something specifically Christian about it, and that it has something to do with the gospel. This impression is entirely false. In reality, the gospel that is spoken of is not the cross of Christ, but our own cross. The verse simply means that our own crosses of trials may be a good means to bring us nearer to God. It's a perfectly good thought, but certainly it is not the gospel. Only one can be sorry that the people on the Titanic could not find a better hymn to die by than that. Did you know that historically? That That's uh, what the, the legend, I don't know if it's actually confirmed or not, but... The, uh, the uh, string instrument players, the quartet, the string quartet that played, they were playing near God to thee uh, as the Titanic was sinking. Um, yeah, they, it would have been better if they could have uh, played the church's one foundation or something like that. <laughs> okay. But there's another hymn in the hymn book. In the cross of Christ thy glory, towering o'er the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story gathers round and sublime. That is certainly better. It is here, not our own crosses, but the cross of Christ, the actual event that took place on Calvary that is spoken of, and that event is celebrated as the center of all history. Certainly the Christian man can sing that hymn, but one misses even there the full Christian sense of the meaning of the cross. The cross is celebrated, but it is not understood. It is well, therefore, that there is another hymn in our hymn book. Listen to this. When I survey the wondrous cross on, when, on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. 
There at length are heard the accents of true Christian feeling, the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Okay, I'm going to put a bookmark there and we'll pick that up next time, but I just want to talk about that. Why is it that we, we teach that, that it's only in Christ that a person can be saved and only by believing the one true gospel? What is it so that makes this one man so special, the Lord Jesus so special? As Majin pointed out, he is one person, but has two fully intact and distinct natures. He's fully human. So if you had seen Jesus, he, he wouldn't have glowed in the dark. He would have looked just like an ordinary Palestinian Jew, because that's what his ancestry was. But he's also fully God, the Son, the second person of the divine trinity. So he's fully man and fully God. And it's because he's fully God that he is able to pay for all of our sins. I'm going to pull up the Heidelberg uh, Catechism here. There's a, um, a great question that asks, they ask the question about why must he also be true God? Um, yeah, question 15. What kind of mediator and deliverer should we look for then? Answer, one is true and righteous, human, yet more powerful than all creatures. That is one who is also true God. And then it asks, why must the mediator be a true and righteous human? Answer, God's justice demands that human nature, which has sinned, must pay for our sin. But a sinful human could never pay for others. Question 17, why must the mediator be a true God? Answer, so that the mediator, by the power of his divinity, might bear the weight of God's wrath and his humanity and earn for us and restore to us righteousness and life. It's glorious stuff, isn't it? Um, it's glorious, glorious, glorious stuff. Okay. Um, man, my, my voice is getting kind of worn out here. Um, all right. Um, 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 um. Looking forward to your covenants video. Um, yeah, I've done a bunch of videos on baptism. But will, be, will I be doing a, a 1689 Federalist Conference as well? Um, I actually debated uh, Brandon Adams. It wasn't much of a debate because he didn't really come prepared with an opening statement, but I did try to contrast perspective with, uh, with his. And I actually, uh, since people have, uh, have contacted me and told me my opening statement was, was really hopeful. I actually pulled it, um, off the debate file. Um, and, uh, just audio file. I'll post that here in the uh, channel thing here real quick here. Uh, here we go. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is 22 minutes long. It's kind of it, it specifically is contrasting our position, at least with with Brandon's, as I understand, at least as I could ascertain from what he what he thinks. Uh, so there's there's that for you. They're strict Baptist. Um, okay. Uh, love you all. Let's see who else is on here. Okay. There's KW. Howdy, howdy, and Julia Falling. Howdy, KB. Good. Oh, uh, good. I'm glad you like the Spurgeon stuff. A lot, a lot of people have said those were really good. You should read. Um, Zachary Eswine is his name. Uh, Zachary Eswine's book, Spurgeon's Sorrows, Realistic Hope for the Depressed, I think is the subtitle. That book is just a gold mine because uh, Spurgeon, Spurgeon uh, really struggled with um, just really crippling depression at times. And um, been there, done that. I know I know how he how he feels because uh, I've, I've been there myself. OK, well, I love you all. Thank you all for, for being here. And uh, thank you so much for watching or for listening.